Hi everyone, and welcome to this new Cubes video, where we're going to learn the basics of Cubes scripting and make a very basic game world. And of course, many thanks to Cubes for sponsoring this episode. So today, we're going to learn how to create our own world in Cubes, and we'll explore the fundamentals of a typical game life cycle. In particular, we'll discuss the different ways that we can interact with the game and create our own logic. Alright, first of all, let's open up Cubes and go to the Build section. As we discussed in this previous episode, this screen is where you can create and edit your own items, avatar clothing pieces, and worlds. In this tutorial, we'll focus on the third tab, the one for the worlds. This page shows you all your current Cubes worlds as a paginated gallery, and you can click on the new button in the bottom right corner to make a new one. This brings us to another pop-up where we can choose the name of our world. Note that contrary to items, which can't be renamed after creation, a Cubes world can totally be renamed afterwards, so don't worry about making a typo or putting in some placeholder title. For this example, let's call our world Game Demo and then click on the Create World button. Ok, we are now in our World Edit page, where we can change its name and its description, and where we can see its thumbnail once it's been set. For now, we'll just go to click on the Edit button at the bottom and open up our brand new world. At the moment, editing or playing a world in Cubes is actually quite similar. Both will start by loading up the game, and in particular all the necessary assets. You see here that we're already loading a bunch of assets. And then you get plunged in the game, usually with your cube's avatar, like here, and the world's logic kicks in to offer you a unique experience. Of course, in this case, we haven't written any custom logic yet, so we don't have this special gameplay to show off to the players. Except that if I press the arrow keys, my avatar starts to move, and if I press the spacebar, it even jumps. And we've got UI, and we've got a crate that we can click on to take in our right hand. So, wait, how come we already have some basic features like this before coding anything? Well, that's because the Cubes team has actually prepared a default script and some fallback functions that are used directly by any new world and that already implement a few interesting features. To see and modify the code, we need to press Escape or click the UI button on mobiles to open up the menu and then click on the Edit Code button. This opens up Cube's built-in code editor, with all of the game's code already loaded in. So if you're a bit familiar with game dev, you might notice that Cube's world use Lua scripting for their logic. Lua is a scripting language that is quite popular in the game-making community, but in this video, I'm not going to talk about Lua Essentials or basic Lua syntax, just feel free to have a look at the official docs for some quick getting started tutorials. Rather, here we're gonna talk about how a cube's world works, and more precisely, what the typical life cycle of a cube's game is, from the moment you load it up from the menu, Except that we're not actually going to go through the entire default code, cause it's a bit long, and it involves a lot of different concepts. Instead, let's select everything by pressing Ctrl A, and clean up our file to start from scratch. It will be easier to really understand what's going on this way. Alright, now the first step is to add at the top of the file a config block. This is where we'll define the map for our game, so the terrain that we'll move on, and all the other 3D models that we need in our world, that can be either items others have created or that we made ourselves in the voxel editor, and all of those objects will be loaded when the game is launched, as we saw earlier. For example, we can pick one of the team's map and import a little create model. The map will automatically replace the default hills that we had before. So, can we try it out? If we want to test our new code, we just have to click the Publish button in the bottom right corner, and this will both update the script's content on the cube server so that it's saved, and instantly trigger a relaunch of the game so that you can test it out in its new version. But the problem is that everything is black. 
and that's because the camera is linked to the player avatar, and we haven't added it to the scene yet. So let's come back to our script and take care of our scene initialization. This is done in the client.onStart function. You'll notice the client.prefix at the start of our function name. Basically, that's because Cubes has got some really neat tools for creating multiplayer games with just a single line of code. And so in that case, you need to differentiate between the server of your game, that handles the global logic, and the functions that are run on each player's computer, which we call the clients. We won't discuss multiplayer today, but just remember that the client prefix is a way of telling cubes that we want this function to run locally on one player's machine, and so it can perform some logic that is specific to this player instance. Anyway, in our case, we want our onStart logic to begin by adding the player to the scene. To instantiate an object, we need to remember three steps. First, create the object in the game from a model. Second, add this new instance to our scene, either directly in the root world object or as a child of an already existing object. And third, place it properly in the 3D space. In the special case of the player, the first step is actually already taken care of by cubes. The player object is automatically prepared in advance and it exists in any game for us to use. So we just need to take care of steps 2 and 3. To add our object to the world, we can use world colon add child and pass in our readily available player object called player and mind the capital P at the beginning. Then we can set its position by computing a 3D position with the X, Y, and Z components in a number 3. A usual trick in cubes is to place the player in the middle of the map, which we can do by using the half width and half depth of the map, and a little offset for the vertical axis. Also, be sure to remember to use the map.scale factor at the end. That's because, at least for now, maps are scaled compared to the rest of the world objects, and this factor is a nice way of placing our objects by counting voxels more easily. Okay, so now if we resave and restart our game, you see that we have our player with its camera, so we can actually see our new world, and even walk in it. Now that we know the essentials of object instantiation, let's actually reuse the same idea to spawn a crate next to our spawning point, using our item reference from before. Of course, this time, the object hasn't been pre-created by cubes because it's specific to our game. So we first need to use the shape constructor and pass it our object reference prefixed by items. This creates a new instance of the object based on the voxel model that we're passing here. Then we can add it to the world and set its position. This time, let's make it relative to the players with a little offset on the horizontal plane. Note that I've checked beforehand that those values look nice for a demo map, but you might need to adapt them depending on the map that you pick. If we relaunch our game, you see that the crate is spawned, but it's in the air. That's because, by default, our offset of 10 in the player Y position spawns us above the map, but then we get the gravity and so we fall down. Except that our crate doesn't. To fix this, we can enable the physics on the crate so that it falls too, next to us. And now we see that the crate is properly placed on the ground when the scene starts. We can even walk to it to push it, and thanks to the built-in physics, it will react to the collisions and be subjected to gravity like our own avatar. Okay, so our client.onStart function now properly initializes everything when the game is launched. That's great. But what if we don't want to run logic just at the very beginning of the game, but while it's running? To execute code continuously, we can use another function called client.tick. For example, suppose that we keep a reference to a crate when we spawn it, and then we check for the distance between our avatar and this crate. We'll say that if we're closer than a given threshold, then the box scales up, or else it reverts to its initial scale. If we republish and retry our game, we see that our new logic is properly executed continuously, and so as we get close to or far from our box, it grows and shrinks accordingly. 
Last but not least, any game engine needs to handle user input events. And in cubes, because the engine is cross-platform, those events are more abstract than an actual key press or mouse button. Instead, the idea is to implement one or more of those six functions to react to one or more of those six input events on computers, tablets, and smartphones. For example, here let's use the action1 to have our player jump. We just need to add the client.action1 function in our script and inside, so that our player instance gets an instant upward boost to its vertical velocity. Once again, the built-in physics system will take care of applying gravity to bring it back down. And here we are! We now have a super simple cubes game with our player avatar running about and jumping and an evil crate that grows when we get close. Of course, this is just a quick peek at cubes coding, and there are a lot more interesting functions that you can use in your cube scripting to create your own gameplay. If you're curious, we'll dive into more advanced cubes programming tips in upcoming episodes. So if you want to learn more, feel free to go say hi on their Discord and join the community, and of course, don't hesitate to like and share this video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. As always, thanks for watching, and take care.